Thanks everyone for coming on. My name is Nick Hubbard, General Manager of Method Building Systems. We produce and market a structural insulated panel um, for use in walls and roofs and floors, residential light commercial, commercial construction. I believe the time has come to advance the status quo and how we build, and we're going to talk about that uh, in our slide presentation here and advanced building technologies with structural insulated panels. Thanks. So, really quick background, came out of the automotive industry. So, we see some gaps in comparing the automotive industry to the construction industry. So this was us. This product we took to the market. It's the world's, still the world's quietest roof rack. Won a number of awards, quality systems, um, original equipment manufactured product for a number of um, OEMs including GM in Detroit, Ford in Australia. So this is the world I came from. Came from uh, precision, modelling, electronic modelling and extreme accuracy and quality control. And this is the world I entered in 2012. So when I began looking at the construction industry I saw this is this was the status quo. And for a large part of construction New Zealand still is the status quo. It's got a number of issues, as I think most of us know. It's poorly insulated. It has a degrading thermal and structural performance over time. It's very wasteful, inaccurate, unhealthy, slow, and we have a lot of inconsistencies and variation in the build process. Here's a few slides on some of those inefficiencies. Here we have energy efficiency, so this was a test done in 2001 in the US. So you've got the outside temperature is the blue line along the bottom. You can see it's getting quite cold there at some points, down to minus 15, up to nearly plus 5. The red line is a 6 by 2 stud wall with extra insulation. So you can see it's not doing a whole lot. The yellow line is a small 115mm structural insulated panel. Here's some of the reasons why these buildings don't work. This is off the government's website, tenancy.gobt.nz, for Housing New Zealand tenants. It's quite accepting the fact that we've got problems with our health and offering some very useful suggestions as band-aid solutions, including going to the supermarket for a range of eco-friendly cleaners to remove the mould. So, I'd like to make a big call today and I'd like to announce the end of, of sticks and fluff, which is our way of referring to frame construction. So you can see quite clearly a number of the inefficiencies and, and problems with, with stick construction right there. So moving forward, what do we do as an industry? How do we move this forward? Well, there's some examples in history. Here we have World War II, tragedy, the catalyst for change. Biplane technology was being perfected. Um, propeller technology has been perfected in the late 30s. Terrible tragedy occurred in World War II and ushered in the jet age. So that generation of engineers and designers will be long remembered for having advanced the status quo in air travel. So you guessed it, it's been a tragedy. Christchurch earthquakes, we're advocating, we move beyond what's been around since 1840 into a new era of high performance and efficient building materials. So what is a structural insulated panel? It consists of very simple form. We have a structural sheathing. In the example here, it's oriented string board. The building behind is made of this particular structural insulated panel. It's a foam retardant EPS core and another piece of, of uh, sheathing on the other side. It gives us a number of advantages highly accurate, it's very durable, it's faster construction, strong, a lot stronger, energy efficiency, kind of obvious. Um, in the real world, you're getting about double the insulation, even from the smallest panel. Very healthy, no opportunity for mould to grow in the wall at all. And of course, very sustainable. Over the, a 50 year life of a building, it'll use only 10% produce only 10% of the carbon footprint of a, uh, a, a stick build. Here it is in action. These are roof panels, 165mm 
R4.2, thermally broken roof panels being lifted into place in large sections. So I'd like to close my brief presentation here and hand over with one liner that just makes sense. Hey, uh, can I show hands to any builders we've got out here today? Hands up high, who's a builder? Can you leave your hand up if you're the boss or you own the business of the building? Do you guys leave, finally just leave your hand up if your business has got a point of difference? No, we've got a point of difference in the business. Congratulations guys, you, you guys set yourselves apart from the rest of the building industry. Uh, my name's Brent Chandon, I'm a builder from Chandon Builders and I've come here today to talk to you guys about the merits of um, Foreman's six panels and how it has uh, influenced our business to give us a point of difference in the, in, the, in the building industry. So I'm going to talk about experiences with SIPs, I'm going to talk about the main differences to conventional building, challenges of working with SIPs, the on-site efficiencies and a bit about certified builders and association support with the SIPs. A couple of uh, projects that we've done here with Nick and his team today. Just a couple of these slides on some of the projects that we have got here. Um, I first started dealing with SIPs about oh, six or seven years ago. I was quite fortunate enough that the um, place that I was looking at, next door neighbour, said to me one day, come over here with this product, muck it around in the backyard there with. And he was a guy from the UK, and he had some samples of some SIPs panels, and he was just chopping it up and mucking around with it. And, and I started talking to him and telling me about how the SIPs had been around in Europe for a long time, he was from the UK. I hadn't been around over there for 20, 30 years. And I thought, well, oh, yeah, just reiterating what Nick said, it just kind of makes sense, you know, that this new construction, high insulation, high structural. But that was even before the earthquakes hit in the Christchurch. I was decided from that point to um, get a bit more training and, and look a bit more into the history and, and what was required in, in SIPs. And I did a training course and we built a first house in Wanaka um, way back in those early days seven years ago. Since that day we have um, built a full range of SIPs uh, right through from very very basic um, square box studio type units right through to complex two storey homes, um, homes that don't even suit SIPs that have got hips and valleys and massive amounts of cuts and waste. Um, so we've done it all. There's a couple of samples of the type of stuff we've been doing there. That's the current stuff we've got in, in Christchurch at the moment. Uh, this was a house we built early on in uh, Rangura. So just moving on to some of the main differences uh, from conventional builds. Obviously it, it's a faster, faster construction time. It doesn't become more even until further on in the construction, obviously, with the insulation going in and a rigid air barrier being uh, on the outside of the building all going in in one process. But it does go together um, fast. It's, not, uh, it's a lot quicker as in construction. Once you do get that roof on, you can start to move on into the inside uh, construction once you get your windows on. So you can speed up construction once you do get that closed in shell. Um, you can order your windows off the plans, especially if they don't go to Safeets, because you're going to get shop drawings of the panel layouts, and you can just go off those shop drawings and get those windows ordered, so that can, once again, speed up the construction. There's a couple of options with the panels. You can um, either have them delivered to site in, in the 1.2 wide uh, panels, or they can be made up in the factory situation and delivered to site and then hired into place. That's obviously the best option. This is just a couple more photos of some of the storage in, in, in the factories and carting of the six panels that we have here. Just a bit more of the construction. This one here was actually done, put together panel by panel on site. This is another one that has been a really complex hillside job um, and we did have to put this one on site, we just couldn't get any high abs on frames or access so we built this two storey place, uh, like I say it's got some, co it's got some complex dormers and a couple of hips and valleys in it as well. I guess over the years we've been working with it for quite some time so we've, we've lined out most of the problems I think um, construction wise of what's going on on site. It's a lot more accurate to work with um, the conventional timber framing, you have to be a bit more like a joiner or an engineer 
your times are a lot less. Um, the accuracy of the panels, especially if you're going panels on site, the sit outs are critical. Uh, your windows, your lid tools. Um, and obviously, your floor tolerances need to be very accurate. You can imagine that if the floor is slightly out, it tips, it exaggerates the, um, the panels if they're not 100% level on the floors, especially if you go up into a two story situation. Uh, it just exaggerates the, the problem right from the bottom to the top. Some of the other issues we had early on is base plates. When you put the base plates down, it's really critical that you're not far away from having your panels um, being delivered to site. You don't want those base plates sitting there getting wet, potentially having timber smell. When you go to put your panels down, fix them. If they're not sitting in there nice and tight, it's the last thing you want is a real tight panel sitting in there. You get the big sleeve chair out and, and knock it around a bit. Um, so really critical to get those there. And also, just making sure, it's one thing that I've worked through quite a bit, is having dimensional timber that's, so you're not spending a lot of time on site buzzing timber there. But there are only minor issues that we've, we've kind of sorted out through here. This is a bit of a photo there um, of base plates going down and a bit of moisture um, and making sure that the panels do fit nicely. One of the other small challenges is obviously if you do get all those singular panels still on the site, is being able to store them on site. That particular picture there is just uh, one site that had two buildings on it and it was quite a challenge to, to have the access there to, to store those panels. So yeah, not too many issues that we haven't come across to date that can't be sort of solved very easily. I just wanted to move on, uh, we bit, touch a wee bit on certified builders. The, the accuracy and the, the level of quality of workmanship that needs to be done with the SIPS panel um, really needs to align with an LBP builder and hopefully a trade qualified builder that can um, know what they're doing when they come to site and, and assembling these things because it doesn't go well if it's not assembled well. So with Nick and myself we've been working together quite closely and trying to align with certified builders and trade qualified builders and LBP builders to install the SIPS panels to make sure that the quality across the whole country um, is, is adhered to a certain level, a minimum standard. The six panels are above the minimum New Zealand standard required, um, so we want to use builders that are above the minimum standard as far as that goes. So we've been trying to, any new inquiries and leads that have been coming through uh, throughout New Zealand, we've been trying to line them up with the local certified builder in that particular area. I also want to talk about the on-site efficiencies as well. Um, obviously, like I said earlier on, the, Ideal scenario is if it's made in a factory situation, comes to site in a container and a higher and higher into the place. So that's the fastest construction um, method, best possible. So just a couple more. That's what I mean. Those panels filling up on site um, in one wall panel. That's quite a big panel that one, but easily handleable off the back of a higher. Once again, four wall panels being installed there. So yeah, that's the end of my talk as, a, as far as the builder goes. Um, in conclusion, basically, I've really enjoyed the, the journey so far, and I'm really keen to see where um, SIPS is going to end up in the New Zealand construction industry. I think it really has got a, a, a place to play in the market, and um, I look forward to the journey. So thanks very much for your time. And I'm a creative juggler. That's probably my best description. Um, I'm here because uh, I find the New Zealand default technical solution unacceptable. And I'm very excited because now that Form and SIPs are on the market, we actually have an alternative and I'm able to provide a house built out of that alternative for my family. If you haven't already gathered, I um, set fairly high standards and I like to do things properly. Um, you don't get to be the best in the world at something by taking shortcuts and it certainly wasn't an option for me when contemplating building a home for my family to take shortcuts either. Um, yes, I wore the British flag, but that's another story. Um, I had a fantastic 10 years building an architectural career in the United Kingdom and I had an opportunity to design and build buildings that were built for future generations. They were made well, they were built to last and they represented phenomenal value for money per square metre. The time to come home was late 2000 and unfortunately in late 2000 this was about to kick off in New Zealand. Um, it's vicious. 
So, um, to me, this clearly didn't rep represent value for money. It certainly wasn't representing anything that we'd be building for future generations, and I was not going to have a bar on it. Certainly when it came time to build my family home. So when the time came, we probably chose one of the more difficult building sites in Auckland. Uh, this was it before we got our, our teeth stuck into it. Dan Triffitts. Uh, it's fair to say that the three previous owners had tried to develop it unsuccessfully. There were consensus plans that for whatever reason hadn't been realised. So where three had failed, I chose to succeed. And uh, with the help of Ray and the team, I think we're pretty well underway. So pretty daunting. I could see its hidden potential, but uh, it required some teenage muscle with machetes and chainsaws and such <coughs> to, to help others see its potential. Uh, and so this is kind of what Ray and the team inherited uh, pretty close to day one. I jokingly refer to my builders as having the tightest buttons in the building industry because they climb that hill many, many times a day. Um, so to briefly run through some of the constraints we've got, and I mention them because I think if we can build in SIPs on this site, you can build in SIPs anywhere. So it's a very steep site. Six metres from road to ridge, which means that uh, accessing site for humans and materials is pretty challenging. And we're also on a major feeder road to the motorway network, so traffic management road closures are just not something I'm particularly happy to consider. Uh, it's narrow, we've only got 15 metres of width and that presents challenges in terms of optimising our aspect. We've got some pretty stunning views in two directions. And uh, halfway into the site there's a cliff uh, with a scheduled boot of power tree which is specifically listed in the district plan and we've got to be very careful um, turning around to a root zone. After we lodged our foundation consent in our stage one, Council in their wisdom decided that we had a risk that needed to be mitigated and it needed to be mitigated for a design life of 100 years. So we found ourselves saw nailing the cliff. Um, you asked Gary which geotech engineer to sign that one off. Yeah, right. Um, so the tree itself uh, needed looking after. Um, we had a neighbour on one side and signed off some minor infringements into the side yard just so I could maximise the width. And on the eve of lodgement of resource consent, she pulled her signature without any explanation. So that caused us some headaches and a bit of redesign and some cost. Uh, but I think the pierce to resist ops is there's a piece of public infrastructure trespassing on my site in the form of a manhole and a sewer, which is four metres above road and 12 metres into the site. And I have to say I was determined not to have to pay to re relocate it, and so I'm not. Um, and we've got views over the motorway and some background noise. So needless to say, the site informed a lot of design decisions, and uh, this is what we're currently building on site at the moment. She's not your ordinary build. Uh, in brief, we've got six split levels, um, and they enable us to cascade the house down the hill from ridge to road. Uh, so again, you can see this, this access is, is critical. I think we've squeezed about every possible square millimetre out of, of the road facing side of the site um, for a family home. We've got uh, extremely tight height and national boundary, um, requirements, partly because of set neighbour and partly because of the topography. So dimensional accuracy is absolutely critical. Uh, we've got some complex geometries and in order for me to have the James Bond shape upstairs, we've got two-storey steel portal frames which my structure needs to be stitched in and around. Um, you're a brave man, Ray. <laughs> So, uh, we achieved resource consent uh, without any major dramas, and then it was time to do some research. Um, given the previous slides, I was not going to ask any builder to carry a pile of sticks up that hill, cut them in half and throw half away. I was looking for something that was smarter and faster and would deliver me a better quality home. Now, we all know the prefab industry has grown some legs in recent years, and so I had some lovely telephone conversations with people who all went, wow, look at that. Good luck. It's far too bespoke for us. We can't do it for you. That was until I spoke to Nick and the team at Formans. And the answer was the right one because it was, wow, we'd love to help you build that. And here's how we can do it. Jackpot. So then we had to have the how much conversation. And the quote came through pretty quickly. I had absolutely no idea what that meant in, in real terms because the reality is that, that very rarely do you get to extract your structure, your bracing, and your installation is a one line item out of a preliminary cost estimate. So I sat down with Ray and said, hey, guess what? 
I found this system. I think it's pretty neat. I'm not interested in pricing it against the usual rubbish. Let's price it against 150 by 50 framing with red board and full fill insulation. It stacked up. So I pushed the go button and we began designing SIPs home. And it stacked up so much so that Ray, who happens to be Ben's builder, went and introduced the product to Ben. And Ben now has the privilege of being the first uh, the first person in a finished SIPs home in Auckland. And that's okay, I think I was still the first to specify. Yes, I am competitive. <laughs> So we're on site and um, you know once the slab's in, it's pretty flipping exciting. And it's very obvious that this is no ordinary build. So these panels are light enough for the guys to manhandle on site. Yes, there's some high open hole, but generally speaking, once they're up on the building platforms, you know, we're talking about polystyrene. They're dimensionally very accurate. My CAD model and my shop drawings got analysed to within a millimetre of their lives. And um, so far, so good. But stuff happens, and the great thing about these panels is a silly a hot wire tool, or um, if you're like me, a rebar or a barbecue so you can drop concrete into the services. They're very easy to adapt on site. And we've had to make some minor modifications, and the best one in the world things happen. We're lifting walls, and when we lift those walls, we're enclosing space. So you add walls and roof, and suddenly we can start contemplating weather on the interior while we're putting weathering on the external skin. And that wall was a heck of a lot easier to lift than the comparative length of timber framing that went next door to support um, the end of the roof. Because it's the forever home, um, and because you only get one chance to put coils in the floor, I've put underfloor heating throughout this home. And in anticipation of two teenage daughters and long showers, I've put a wet back on a wood burner as well. My gut feel is that actually there's some redundancy in all of this, because our home is going to be phenomenally snug and warm. We've got great solar orientation, we've got more mass than you care to contemplate, um, and we've got a super insulated envelope that's going to perform the same in 20, 30, 40, 50 years' time as it is now on day one. That is because the materials are relatively inert, because of all the issues Nick mentioned about no cavity, no mould. It's a super, super insulator. Um, so if you follow that through other people's builds, I'm quite happy to have the nice to haves. But if you take that through construction in general, um, you know, then what you're saying actually is that with the right design and with super insulation and the efficiencies of building on site, we're actually talking about reducing the capital cost of building. Because we then don't have to add in the heating and the cooling systems, potentially we're reducing the capital cost of the heating and cooling systems. And then quid pro quo, we're reducing the running cost or the operating costs of those buildings as well. We're also building structures that will last. We're building structures that will be there for future generations. So we're extending the life cycle of these buildings. You extend its life cycle, you reduce the cost of replacement over its life. There will be other elements that will fail before the SIPs panels will fail. And quid pro quo, you're reducing the, cap the um, life cycle cost. So we reduce capital cost, running cost, life cycle costs, and it's better for the environment. Why wouldn't you? Um, ben, congratulations on leading me to it. Um, as you know, these houses are well worth the wait, and you know, I absolutely can't wait to move in. So, and if anybody's keen to come and see it, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nino Kozlirca, Kozlirca uh, Architecture, just another crazy European architect. Um, after consenting and building quite a few conventional houses, I still couldn't get the idea why this would be a standard. Um, and now after uh, many SIP houses being built, yeah, I, I can tell you that that's, that's where you really want to move forward. It gives you all the things that uh, were impossible to be built or very not feasible to be built with any other conventional system. So really, um, let's dig into it uh, just quickly with a few details. And I think you, at the end of this uh, meeting, you'll be quite excited about starting to design with SIPs. We really think that uh, designing with small and SIPs, uh, you can do smart, cost-effective and eco-friendly um, designs and houses buildings, but still maintaining your design freedom. I don't know, when I went to conventional 3604 uh, solutions, I thought, hey, you can really, really design very nice things here. And then you speak with builders and they go like, well, half of this is not feasible, is it? So I don't know what to do. You can probably just do a few boxes then and uh, trust roof or so, but now it's, let's go beyond that, really. So, first thing to consider is basically 
uh, thinking panel sizes. So we have um, obviously standard sizes, 1200 wide, 24, 27, 3 million and 6.1 meter uh, panels. And if you do consider that, basically you lower your wastage very much. But also, you know, when, when you start to think models, all of a sudden designs look to look great. Just for the fact of using standard sizes, it just stacks up and you have a beautiful pattern on, on elevations and stuff. So these videos are also working. Let's look at one panelization optimization, we call it. Using the panel and then using the half of the panel on the other side to actually form a wall. That makes sense. If the window was smaller, we can use offcuts, bottom and top. So that's what we talk about when we say panelization. And you minimize your wastage, you can use the offcuts on the other side for another lintel and so on. If that seems too complicated, but it's not really, you can do it later as well. This is just a little example. You have an elevation, simple design, and put your grid lines on top of that. And just by that, you realize where you might shift you know, your window left or right a little bit. And by just doing that, you basically optimize your wastage. And uh, yeah, design just looks great at the end. It's easier to do with. But um, so that's panelization. You can go crazy with that. I designed a house for myself as well. And I just by using the panels, you start realizing, hey, you have all these opportunities to do great stuff. Paired with walls, great overhangs, um, I mean, oh, you name it really. All the stuff that were supposed to be unfeasible and so oh, it's just easy to do it uh, with panels. And we'll look at a few details to just show you that. That's something you can do. So basically, basically what we usually do, put the roof panels on top of the wall panels because it really doesn't make sense to insulate the sofit as such. But on the other hand, panels are like large i beams so they extend beautifully through. So you can have large overhangs if you extend the panels over. If you don't, so looking at this large member, uh, large timber member to close the sit panel, that's a lintel. So you can use it as a lintel and all, all of a sudden have a potential for a full height window. Well, another option is to do it in concrete, but um, that's really the only one I have. So SIPs allow you to do that, and that's just part of the standard solution that comes with former panels. Another one here with joist hinges sitting on top of the wall panels. Conventionally, we'd be putting mid floor on top of the wall, right? And how do you insulate between the joist and make it airtight as well? It's closely impossible, really. But if you do it like this, you have completely uninterrupted building envelope all around and you achieve, you know, like passive standards of uh, air tightness by just putting panel to panel. Again, form and standard details. We give you the access to all these details, obviously. We, uh, I'm working myself also in the library so you can uh, have access to all the latest sort of um, achievements sort of thing. Um, I designed the stand um, uh, behind you, the two-story one, and there's all the details you can look at uh, just to get your head around the, uh, uh, the panels. As soon as you do that, you'll come up with better solutions. So, yeah, let's give it a go. And yes, you can optimize to great degree. I'm just trying to show you here, and we're doing these videos for, to, to help you going through the designs as well. By using standard sizes of our panels and standard sizes for mid floors and so, you can optimize your internal lining, you can, you know, cut the wastage and have standard um, uh, internal ceiling heights. All this is just simply possible as soon as you get your head around uh, the panels. So if you want to be cost effective, so like building confidence and so, yes you can be. Minimize waste, it should be very cost effective. Winning the project uh, at the end of the day. This is a SIP house. I mean, the capacity of the panel as such, allowing you for, you know, tall open voids. This is a huge bracing capacity in the panel. And you're using that to do beautiful designs. And no one can say that that doesn't work. It does work, and it worked before. All this. It's super bracing in the upper floor, but it's also so light that you minimize your cost of foundation. So you can trace stuff, really. Just for the fact of using something that is uh, strong as a concrete, but light as paper. Exaggerating, I know. But it's close to that, really. Trust me. <laughs> if you don't trust me, we'll trust the guy coming next to me, uh, after me, basically. Yeah. Um, engineer Brian, he'll support that, right? <laughs> we really believe, and I can assure you, it design freedom in your hands again. It shouldn't be, you know, costing you a fortune to do great stuff. And that's performance. Thank you very much. And keep the big hand also, because Brian is coming on stage.
G'day, I'm Brian. I'm the director of a multidiscipline design practice. We've got engineers, structural engineers, mechanical engineers, and architects in the house. And as a company, we've got significant experience in the design expertise and the design of our aquatic facilities. And these are really high performance, challenging environments. Um, we need to ensure control, energy efficiency, and legacy. In the Formix SIP system, we've got a product providing similar, high performance, cost effective environments at a domestic level for your next home or your next design. As an industry, we believe that there is a better way. As designers, we can lead the charge. And as homeowners, we no longer need to accept or tolerate poor performing, leaky, inefficient living environments with big energy bills and sick kits. Create our external consultants to meet the building systems, and we're supporting them with structure and compliance in this instance. I'm a chartered engineer, and I work in the background to ensure that you can use performance set panels with confidence for your next project. As the name Structural Insulator Panels suggests, there's uh, one panel doing two jobs. There's the structure, which is your load parts, and there's insulation, which is environment and energy efficiency. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk you through really briefly some of the structural compliance and performance aspects. So what is the basis for design? Well, this product's been used internationally for several decades, and in fact, in its current form, it's been around for over 50 years. That's led to a wealth of knowledge hidden behind the development and application. It's in fact cited in the International Residential Code, which has a really high burden of proof. The design that we're using for the Formic SIP panels follows US verification procedures with guidance from the National Testing Association, the Structural Insulated Panel Association, and the American Society of Engineers. So our design approach is built on a bedrock of American literature and design guidance based on extensive testing and research, but specifically engineered for New Zealand conditions, including New Zealand building code requirements, New Zealand loading conditions, and of course, uh, New Zealand timber, which is slightly weaker than the rest of the world. Our approach has been peer reviewed, it's backed by Codemark, and it's been accepted by building consent authorities throughout the country, including here in Auckland, as you have just heard. So here's an image of some of the testing that's been carried out. This relates to seismic uh, capacity, and of course, earthquake performance is very topical at the moment. Light stick, light stick construction, SIPS has very light mass relative to its strength, but unlike stick construction, SIPS acts as a bracing panel in its own right. This particular test was carried out at the University of California in Berkeley, and they've demonstrated that the SIPS system has high levels of energy absorption, strength comparable to dual strain structural ply, and dependable, predictable performance, which as a designer, that's what we're looking for. So, how does SIP work? For actual loading, the load bearing capacity is over three tonnes per metre. That's all carried by the facing panel. Should you actually need a little bit more than that, we reinforce the joints that Nino was talking about with some structural tender, particularly around concentrated loads. For bending, the facing panel provides the flexural strength of the set panels. Now these designs are typically governed by uh, displacement, deflection, long-term displacement. So you end up with a massive amount, massive redundancy in the strength capacity of these systems. And again, we use the joints and structural timber, as you can see in the panel and the building behind us, to further strengthen the roofs and, and, and get bigger stands from that. In terms of shear, the core provides the bulk of the capacity, but the strength's really a function of the detailing at the ends, which is why we pay really close attention to that, and uh, Nino uh, has the details online because um, we want to ensure you've got adequate capacity at the end. So, in summary, Formant SIP system is a high performance engineered system. It meets the requirements of the New Zealand Building Code. It's endorsed and certified by chartered engineering professionals such as myself. It's endorsed by Codemark and it's accepted by building consent authorities throughout the country so you can use this on your next project with confidence. Tom, uh, Ben, and uh, I'm just going to chat to you today uh, very briefly on our uh, recent journey of building our dream home with uh, performance panels. So about 18 months ago, uh, my fiance Kylie and I set out to, uh, to build our dream home in a plot of land that looked something like that when we first found it. It's Castor Bay um, over on the North Shore about 1,400 square metres. It had been on the market for 
I think over six years, and I wanted to touch it. Um, what some people saw as an ugly duckling, we sort of saw a lot of opportunity. Um, I think some people thought a little bit crazy, but um, set about trying to trying to tame it. Completely overgrown, uh, with lots of noxious weeds, ginger, undergrowth, overgrowth, all sorts of growth. Um, and probably what put most people off is right through the middle here. It's a train kind of shape. But right through the middle is a, uh, a stream that pretty much divides the section in, in two. We went for a little bit of a, a stroll through the undergrowth and found surrounding the whole site was this beautiful native bush, um, kanuka, uh, lots of tree ferns, punga, um, some beautiful cowrie as well. And sort of more we looked, we just fell in love with the section. We thought it was an amazing opportunity to create a um, I guess a unique home that worked with the land and the natural assets and everything that was there, and rather than uh, trying to fight it. Um, and we came up with the idea of basically building uh, two independent pods either side of the stream. One side, living, kitchen, dining, the other side, bedrooms, bathrooms, laundry, and connect them together with a glass bridge so that you could sort of wake up in the morning and around the corner is sort of Auckland, and then you wake up and you stare at this beautiful uh, bush and things like that. We had no idea if we could do it, um, sounded good. I've worked with uh, Ray and Haven Renovations on the block and um, gave them a bell and um, sort of typical go-to attitude, sure you can do whatever you want, just depends how much you want to spend, was, was the answer. So first step was went to the council, had a meeting with them, just to say, hey, can you even do something like this? Would they let us even build so close to a stream? Some points are only probably 500 mil away from um, the sort of natural waterway. And can we span it? They were incredibly supportive um, and sort of basically gave us the confidence that yes, we could build what we we're trying to build as long as we kind of followed um, the boxes along the way. So, with that in mind, we um, made an offer, half the asking price, four months due diligence, and 0% deposit. And I guess after six years, he was pretty keen to get rid of it and signed within a matter of hours, and we were the conditional owners of this bit of land. A bit like uh, Tonya, we, um, once we had a resource consent, went about clearing the land by hand. Just used little saws like that. It was all undergrowth, it didn't touch any of the mature trees or anything like that. And pretty quickly you realise there's actually a lot of land in there, hidden away, and um, sort of set about trying to work. Uh, built the house pretty early on. We realised we wanted to, um, I guess in that vein of working with the, the land instead of against it, was wanted to explore prefabrication and had this my naivety. So we could probably build what I thought was two big uh, rectangles, connected by a smaller one. We could probably build this in a warehouse somewhere and um, basically drive it on the site, pump it on and be in within a couple of months, was my initial thoughts. Um, Ray pretty quickly pointed out this thing was up to 15 metres long, 6 metres wide. How the hell are you going to get it down the main road, let alone down our little right away? So he um, suggested that we talk to uh, Formans, because he'd been working with uh, Tommy already, and look at uh, stand up panels as a solution. So we flew down to Christchurch. We realised while we'd come to look at prefabrication around the speed, big light on the land, the efficiencies, when we walked into the studio um, in Christchurch here, it was a, it's quite cold in Auckland today, but um, it was sort of that typical mid-winter uh, Christchurch frost. Walked in there, jackets on, he was nothing, I think he's in a t-shirt in this little studio. Um, built out sips, no heating on, and it just sort of made, from that point on, complete sense. Um, we really started to realise the benefits of the thermal, um, uh, benefits of using the product as well. So, at that stage, we um, sort of worked through the process with the guys, the panelisation, got that underway, and at the same time started uh, working on the, the, um, the section. We reformed the, the stream to hold a 100 year flood event, um, then spent hours uh, lining it. Over, uh, I think, about 40 tonnes of rock, we moved by hand and placed individually, and then sort of started planting it out. I think we, uh, it's probably our first child. Um, then the earthworks began, and uh, that was about probably seven, seven and a half months ago, the earthworks began. Timber driven piles, uh, and then the old uh, sub going down, 
We're pretty keen to design away their whole effect of being on piles, uh, on poles. And we hit a lot of canted levered sections, which means a lot of steel. Um, probably a one disappointment, nothing to do with the performance system, but um, didn't get that aha, that magical moment of the whole house going up at once because we spent so long waiting for things like steel um, and different bits and pieces along the way. So sort of progressed a little bit um, in pieces. But here's our um, panels sitting in a uh, warehouse in uh, East Tamaki. And it was quite a, a weird feeling to come and basically see your house before much has even happened on site. Like a giant jigsaw puzzle um, behind Kylie. There's our roof panels. We went for the Philly Monty 315 mils, and then the walls are 165, the sort of thinner ones you can see there. And pretty quickly on site, uh, panels delivered, and um, they were stood individually. So there's uh, Garrett and Ray looking very builder like, assessing the plans. And that's the first panel, first sort of three panels slotting into place over on our bedroom sort of side. Made it look out like I was doing lots of work, just opposed for a couple of photos and you look like you're building it. Genius. Um, but no, did give a hand, that was really satisfying. Uh, standing all the panels up. And basically, in the space of the day, it was pretty much what uh, the bedroom sort of side looked uh, like. Really satisfying as well, because you don't have the skeleton that you're looking through on a normal sort of um, timber framing. Very quickly you can see where your windows were, where your rooms were going to be in the actual space. It actually felt like a house um, very, very quickly. Ceiling panels, um, all manually lifted. Uh, they were quite difficult, I think, Aaron, especially for a man of your great height. Um, and yeah, just me lugging them around, lifting them up, and pretty quickly uh, wrapped and ready to be clad and so we um, oh, I went over on the, uh, on the roof, uh, went for a membrane um, flat uh, roof, so working with uh, Neurolite and the, the team with the Neuroply system, torched on, triple wire, and um, so I guess it's very flexible and what you can um, build straight on top of, of the panels as well. Internally, um, the walls are your, your timber framing, and um, all the external walls are the panels. Our master bedroom to wake up to in the morning, so full height, a lot of uh, full height, pretty much everything is full height, um, windows and doors. And there's the wiring going in pretty quickly with uh, clad and cedar, leaving it into the landscape. And then over on the uh, living side, it sort of um, came along um, a little bit later. Plenty of steel, but a three metre cantilever there. Um, and again, panels arriving on site, and very quickly uh, gluing down on the uh, bottom plate there, foam for sort of air tightness in between and down the, the bottom. Uh, very quickly, in the space of more or less a day, we've got a uh, pretty well um, formed pod. And then, this is the inside of the living pod. It's probably another thing that we didn't appreciate until it came to design is. It gave us, exactly like Nina was saying, the design uh, freedom to basically achieve the vision that we had, which was this big open space. Um, normal sort of engineering would have had us with three steel portals down there, which are running right through the middle of the windows where we wanted benches. But that's literally the, um, the six, uh, spanning that full sort of six metre um, roof space there. And the uh, vertical cedar contrasting the horizontal on the entry foyer there. Yeah, again, just always looking for new, different uh, materials. That's uh, composite um, decking from Outdoor. The new generation just came out this year, and um, beautiful product that looks so natural that the value was thought it was hardwood. Uh, and then the sort of back of the, the living um, area taking shape. Uh, the stream starting to mature really nicely now, and looking very, very natural. Um, and through to pretty much a almost completed uh, house. And awesomely, on Friday we spent our first night in the house, um, which was fantastic. After not too much long, probably about seven, seven and a half months, um, it's all come up together, come together really, uh, really beautifully, such a unique setting with the, the bush and everything. Um, in, the, in the background and the stream coming through. Yeah, spent the last sort of three nights there. 
and um, really starting to, we don't have any heating in the house yet, uh, but even on a morning like this, um, just the natural uh, living in the home, um, under floor heating, uh, showers and things like that, it's already starting to uh, feel like the thermal um, benefits and insulation that it's providing. So it's definitely somewhere we plan on spending um, many years in, and um, definitely been validated, I guess, our decision to build performance um, to the time and time again. So thank you, and I'll hand you back to Nick. Thanks, Dean. That concludes the presentation, structure and slide panels. I'd like to leave you with a thought. Fast forward 30, 40 years, done our time as a generation of construction industry, We've moved it forward. Imagine your grandson coming up to you saying, Grandpa, just been doing some renovations. I opened the wall up, and there's this pile of pink stuff lying at the bottom of the wall. Grandpa, did you really think that was going to keep you warm? Thank you, and you can see us on the scene afterwards.